to Greg uh, to begin the presentation. Um, I'm going to be recording this and this will be posted hopefully tomorrow on the Camden Public Library's uh, program's YouTube page and also on our Facebook page. Thank you very much and take it away, Greg. Okay. Um, and as I'm going along, we're going to hopefully have a fairly generous uh, question and answer period at the end of this. Um, feel free to type in questions in the chat box as we go, and I may or may not answer them as we move along. Um, that will kind of be my choice. Um, so I typically start out these kind of programs with some kind of image of a toad and toad stool, just kind of harking back not long ago into the part of the world uh, that we live in that was so mycophobic, fearing mushrooms, and that's changing rapidly. Um, as indicated by the interest in this kinds of program. Um, I do want to thank the Canada Public Library for shifting what was going to be a face-to-face -face presentation into a virtual presentation um, responding to this need and always for the Maine Mycological Association. Mary Yerlina, who's been putting together our winter uh, programs, um, and Jean Farrell, who is uh, managing our membership, and of course, Michaeline, uh, my good friend, um, who's our president. So let's dive in. Um, uh -oh, there we go. Um, so we're going to talk about mushrooming practices. We're going to talk about them as related to Maine and New England. Um, we're going to see some gorgeous photos of mushrooms, and I'll talk about some of those. But this is really kind of an exploration of mushrooming and mushroom practices um, across primarily Maine, but touching on New England as well. Um, and it's based on a survey because most of the time, mushroomers do not gather in huge offerings. If you're anybody like me, I like to do mushrooming alone, out in the woods, just me. Very few people I'll go out with unless I'm teaching. Um, and that's true of a lot of people, a lot of introverts, a lot of people that seek that sense of peace and a return of their soul out in nature. Um, and it's a perfect activity um, for social distancing, which has suddenly gotten so popular. Remember when people used to think you were odd if you were avoiding other people? Hmm, how might they change? Um, so with a group of people that mostly are out there in the world alone, how do we understand how they learn, what their needs are, and, and how do we respond to that? And so we, we, I did this survey, and it's building on a survey that I sent out first in 2007. And back then, I had a fledgling email list, and I had a total of about 54 return surveys. And it was a lot of fun. But I wanted to add to that survey and build on some anecdotal knowledge about how people who are out in the world mushrooming learn their craft um, what kind of experiences they have, um, what venues for learning um, they value, obviously what are the mushrooms that they value to collect for food and medicine, um, and also given my experience working with the poison centers uh, across northern New England and even down into Massachusetts and Rhode Island, I'm very interested in any adverse experiences, we'll call them that, that people have had um, after eating mushrooms. So we're going to touch on all those pieces. <clears throat> um, so the goal was to get as many people to respond to a survey who are out there collecting and using mushrooms. Um, and we collected some limited geographic information, um, but mostly it was about mushrooming and, and, the, and the value that, and experiences that they've had. Um, when we sent it out, um, we, it was me, um, I set the first surveys out, I think the day after Christmas, and they were all, for the most part, went out in the, within about two weeks, uh, late December, January um, of this year. Um, and we targeted people who we knew were mushrooming. So we, I sent it out to all the members of the Maine Mycological Association, um, and everybody who I had on my Mushrooms for Health email list. Um, and those were people who had attended talks, walks, who had expressed interest. Um, all, all in all, it went out to 600, 650 people. And I also invited people who saw the survey to pass it on to someone else 
who they thought might be interested. <clears throat> but it was definitely targeted to mushroomers or mushroom wannabes, I call them, people who are interested in learning. I used the SurveyMonkey platform and based the survey on about 13 pretty complex questions. And if any of you have done surveys of people, you'll know if we sent out six or 700 surveys and we got 245 back, it was quite an incredible response. Um, people were interested. I chose that window of time when people had some downtime um, to focus on that. I could have done it right now and probably even gotten more surveys back because we are, we are all um, cut off from our normal distractions. Um, and we got surveys back from across a range of experiences. I'll talk about that. <clears throat> so the 245 surveys returned, um, close to 200 were, for, were main people, which is what my primary target was, because I wanted the experience of people who, uh, who were collecting and using mushrooms in Maine. Secondarily, uh, New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, we had some from Rhode Island. Um, and then some people didn't indicate where they were from, and there were some of them that uh, were just scattered around the country, Texas, Ohio, California, um, Florida, snowboards, I, snowbirds, I think. Um, and I put the basket of spring morels there just as kind of a teaser because with this relatively early warm spring, snow is kind of notwithstanding, um, we should have our spring mushrooms coming up. Uh, I'm expecting them to show by the end of April, we'll see. So one of the first questions we ask, how long have you been collecting and using mushrooms? How long have you been foraging? And it ranged, there are people who've been doing it, I've been doing it for a couple of months, they said, or a year or a couple of years, up to 77 years. And I know the woman who's been doing it for 77 years. She lives down in Massachusetts. Um, wonderful, wonderful woman. And her, well, I have a quote in, her, in here later on from her. Um, about a third um, had been collecting and using mushrooms for more than 20 years. And about that same percentage for five years or less. So it was a good range. We asked people, um, when did they start collecting? When did they start using mushrooms? And you can see the range. There were some, you know, 5% or so that started before they were 10 years old. And those are people who learned in their family. 10 to 20, most of those as well, learned within a family context or as adolescents. And then the, the numbers rose quickly. A number of people in their 20s and 30s, a lot of people between the ages of 40 and 60, but a pretty even distribution all in all across adulthood. And one of the things we are really interested in, how are people learning? What, what things are they turning to to pick up those skills? What are they valuing? And how is that changing? And so we ask, if you collect and use them, um, where, what resources have you used to learn? Um, you, I ask people to check all that apply. And we also ask, what did you value the most? <clears throat> so still, in this day of social media and, and websites, um, close to 100% said they use field guides of some kind. They're almost ubiquitous. Um, they cover different parts of the, the country. They're at different levels of depth, um, very broadly used. But second um, is the mushroom websites, which has been growing. Um, and there are some really, really good ones out there. Um, and there's some that I don't trust very much. Um, but still, a lot of reliance on that. Um, I turn very regularly to the Quebec website, Michael Quebec, um, which is a deep, rich resource of information. It is in French. So if you get deterred by that, my French is horrible, but I find it incredibly useful. Um, websites like um, mushroomexpert.com is an excellent one, um, but there's a, there's a few around that are really, really useful. Um, under websites, just a little bit less than that are folks who have attended a mushroom ID class or workshop or some kind of walk or talk, uh, more than two thirds of, in each group. Um, and then just over half reported the use of a mentor. Somebody that they know, family or otherwise, who's got that knowledge and they can trust that knowledge base. 
um, and a growing number, much more. If they, when I'd asked this 12 years ago, there have been almost none, um, are relying on Facebook sites, social media sites. And about a half of the people um, attend um, or associate with a mushroom club or like the Maine Mycological Asso Association or others, Maine. We have some Boston Mycological Association folks as well, coma. So what did people really rely on? You know, all in all, if people have been doing this for very long, they said, I rely on a combination of things. Books, field guides, mentor, classes, um, some people said, I learned within my family. I can trace my knowledge back four generations for sure, I suspect a lot longer. But my most valuable resource is my father, who serves as a mushroom mentor with lots of experience and knowledge. Of course, that's my son. So, um, but more than anything else, people said, I use a combination. I use a lot of things. And really quickly, that's what I learned was valuable. Um, early on, I was using two or three or four different field guides, checking and cross-checking back and forth. Um, so that was interesting for all of us. Um, now, I also wanted to know, and I recognize that this question, if you do not collect and eat wild mushrooms, what holds you back from doing so? I was probably aiming this question at the wrong crowd. Um, because of those, you know, only 42 people even answered this question. It was skipped by over 200. Um, but the biggest reason that they wouldn't collect if they answered this was, I don't know enough. And they, they said that in a variety of ways. I don't know enough about mushrooms. I don't trust my knowledge. Um, I don't have the resources that I can rely on. And underneath that is always, for all of us, that fear of being poisoned. None of them, absolutely no one said, I don't collect and eat wild mushrooms because I've had a past bad experience with eating them, which is interesting. But we'll get more into that kind of thing in a minute. Um, so this is a little bit more information why I don't eat wild mushrooms. Um, and the ones I like, it says, you know, I, I'm cautious and I take this slowly. I'm in the learning phase, I'm not ready. I only trust the ones I've learned over a number of years, and I'm really careful with each new species I pick up. I, don't, I do pick wild mushrooms, but I've never been confident enough to actually eat them. And that's what I find. If people are learning on their own, their learning curve is really gradual, really slow. That was my re, you know, response back in the mid 70s when I started learning mushrooms. I didn't know anybody else I can turn to. I didn't have a mentor. Um, and so my learning curve was really slow. Um, and some people, the one on the bottom here, I do collect and eat wild mushrooms, but I've seen so many mistakes made by casual and some dedicated collectors that I avoid eating wild mushrooms collected by others. So caution is still an overwhelming piece here. Um, as a person who responds to, um, to the uh, poison centers across the region, I, I respect caution. Um, uh, there's a question in the chat box. Uh, Russ Cohen says, you, you include a photo of lilac brown bolete. I'll talk about that more later. He says, do you consider that species to be safely edible? I say, absolutely not. And I say that, Russ, based on my own personal experience, it's the only mu mushroom that's ever sickened me. And by probably by now, at least 30 cases that I've dealt with in the poison centers. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's move on here. And this is one of the examples that, of the, that really speaks to that caution. On the right hand split of the screen is the chicken mushroom or the sulfur shelf. Uh, Lady of Porus sulfurius. On the left hand side, you know, it's not a great picture, um, with the knife blade on top of it is another Lady of Porus that's growing on um, hemlock. And you can see the other mushrooms in that picture are the hemlock varnish conch, um, reishi or Ganoderma tsuge. And if you find the Lady of Porus fruiting on a conifer, you know. A, you don't want to eat it, and B, it falls into a different species, um, 
Ladyoporus um, heronensis. Um, so it's a good reason to be cautious. And we'll be talking more about the sulfur shelf chicken mushroom complex in a little bit when we get to problems. <clears throat> so I did a, 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 a kind of a, I asked people what mushrooms they first collected and ate. And I was in my clumsiness in terms of asking good survey questions. I let them answer it as a common name or a, um, a formal scientific name. And so it was hard to collect the information. So I did uh, mushroom, um, excuse me, the webs, the survey um, monkey will do a wordle. And so you can see what people first ate, you know, oyster mushrooms, chaga, chanterelles, black trumpets, uh, hen of the woods, chicken of the woods, um, uh, some puffballs, meadow mushrooms, hedgehogs. You know, most of those, you know, to my mind, all fit into the, the group of foolproof uh, mushrooms. Um, <clears throat> so moving on. The next thing I ask about, which is always fascinating for me, I ask people to name their top 10 mushrooms. Um, and for people who've been doing it a long time, they may have many, many more, but I ask them to, to name the top 10. Some people only put down one or two or three or four um, because that's all they eat. So that's good information as well. Um, consistently, 12 years ago and um, this year, the Golden chanterelles and the black trumpets came in one and two. So here's the list, and I'm going to go through these because I know uh, it's fairly small print. So for everybody, whether they're seasoned or not, the black trumpet was number one. Now, 12, 13 years ago, it was number two. And I think it was because people did not find it as often. But everybody knows, sees, and can recognize chanterelles. So it's way up there, very close to the chanterelles um, and the black trumpet. And just beneath that um, was the head of the woods, or maitake. Again, common, easily uh, identified, um, and widely recognized as edible. And for the oyster mushrooms, I lumped all the species together. Some people just put oysters, some put the species. So this includes the spring, early summer oyster mushrooms, the Pleurotus um, um, populinus. It mean, includes the midsummer ones, the, the uh, uh, pulmonarius, as well as the, the typical fall mushrooms, the uh, Pleurotus austriatus. Um, broadly used across, and you can see across the top here, um, it's their their first, their second, their third, their fourth. So it falls in different categories. The hen of the woods, excuse me, the chicken of the woods was just after oysters. And then the Boletus edulis group, the Porcini, Steinpilz, Penny Bun, King Bolete group, um, Lion's Mane, the Morels. And, you know, interesting, when you get to Morels, look at the first, second, and third ranks, how, may, how high those numbers are. Not too many people find them, but those who do really love them. And I can tell you that many of the people that remarked on the morels, or the morals, morels, um, collected and found them in, out in an, a state other than Maine. Um, the hidden, hidden or pandem, the hedgehog or sweet tooth was after that. Various puffballs, and I lumped those together because um, people were not discerning in their answers and then chaga, matsutake, and the various uh, species of the agaricus. So I'm gonna talk about this, this is everybody, and then I'll talk about the more seasoned collectors separately here in a second. So not unusually, the ones that I typically call the foolproof few were included in this. The mushrooms that I see as common, easily recognized and identified without easy toxic lookalikes. Um, including, so if you pass a sugar maple um, like that's covered with oyster mushrooms like these in the late fall here, it's typically October and into November, it's easy to see, they're easily recognized and widely eaten across the world. So very, very highly desirable. The head of the woods, similarly. Now, the Lady of Porus, the sulfur shelf or chicken of the woods, I always worry about that one being 
on somebody's I've got to eat that list. Because we'll see in a minute, it causes problems. So if we go on to the top species for people who have more than 20 years experience, the first three are the same. But number four is that Boletus edulis complex. So they've been collecting for a while. They feel like they can identify the, the uh, King Bolete group, um, and they love them, and they're really good. I consider that group not the beginner's mushroom because there's some lookalikes I want to talk about in a minute, and people make mistakes and get sick. So take your time with it. The rest of them are pretty similar. Um, Morels were a little bit higher up. Um, now, if you got way down further, there were some interesting additions. Things like the parasol mushroom, Macrolepiota, Procera, or Procumbens, depending on which one you use. Um, and even below that, some really interesting, good, wonderful mushrooms that are not as common, not as, uh, as recognized, like some of the um, milky caps, the Lactarius um, volumus or Corygus or um, Hygrophoroides, uh, just some excellent mushrooms. Um, so I, I have morels in here. Someone typed in, I'd be interested to hear your take on false morels. Um, and, you know, he says that very experienced friends in Eastern Europe eat them well cooked. My thoughts? Boy, and you know, if you were, we're talking about the false morel, I'm gonna limit it to one species, the Gyromitra esculenta, which is the classic false morel, which in Maine is far more common um, than the true morels in most of the state. Um, so for that species, if it's well cooked, it's edible, but the toxin in it is really nasty. So if you undercook them, eat them raw, or even breathe the fumes while you're boiling them, um, it can be quite toxic. So I am, I'm really cautious about that group. Um, and I think with good reason. Others that are much more desirable um, are the, the lion's mane, which comes in the, most of the time in the September and October here. Lovely edible when it's young and firm. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Boletus edulis complex. But the matsutake, which again, 15 years ago was hardly ever collected and used and now is getting quite popular. The shaggy mane, the third mushroom I ever ate and still one of my favorites. And the puffballs, including the giant puffball, um, shown here on the bottom right. Um, now, I wanna talk about the Boletus edulis complex because it's a great mushroom and I'm gonna talk in a minute about a couple that are lookalikes. If you've got a, a bolete that when it starts out, it has a pure white spore surface, that pore underside, that over time turns yellow and then green, and no aspect of the mushroom turns blue upon cutting or bruising, is probably on, in this complex if it also has the net-like veining on the stem. But be careful, learn them slowly, bring a mentor, show them before you ever think about eating them so you know what you've got. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. Because where we went from the really good edibles is what have, if you've ever had an experience that's been bad, if you ever become ill, what happened? Now the good sign, if you'll notice this, 85% of the people who answered this survey said, no, I've never been sick eating a wild mushroom. But the small number that did, some said about 3% said I misidentified this mushroom. Some said about the same percentage, two to 3% said I, I ate it believing it was edible, but it wasn't. And that may have been a misidentification also. Um, I worry about the number that ate them on the advice of somebody else. And I'll talk about that in a minute more too. And about 6% said, you know, I get sick with this mushrooms, but other people I know eat it very well. And that's what we're, we're gonna talk more about. Because the next question, well, let's get to, the, to the, the problem species. So in this, the most common mushroom that people said I've had trouble with is that sulfur shell or the chicken mushroom, that ladyoporous group. And for sure, if it's raw or undercooked, it will sicken just about everybody who eats it. But some people just have trouble tolerating it anyway. So that's one, if you're eating it, start out slowly, 
um, be cautious about bringing that to a potluck dinner. You know, just, just use some caution around it. The honey mushrooms the same way. I love that mushroom. In fact, I love both of those mushrooms. And I eat a lot of honey mushrooms, but if it's undercooked, it's toxic. If you eat it raw, you will get sick. Um, and in the bow leads, I'm going to talk more about that group, so I'm just going to let that, that stand for itself, other than the lexinums, the scaber stalks. And I worry about the lexinums because there are so many of them, probably 100 species in North America that are named. Um, and almost every field guide or website only contains a few. And so sometimes people get in trouble with, with those. And about 3% of our poisonings um, occur in that species, or in that genus of mushrooms. The others, I'm gonna use the common names. Hypomyces is the lobster mushroom. And I've been seeing more toxic reactions to those where they under um, parasitized. Um, and some questions, I worry about that. And a few people react to the sweet tooth, the hedgehog. The sporasis, is called the cauliflower mushroom. Um, those who undercook it get sick. It's not very common at all in Maine, but in the people who responded to that were from Massachusetts and, and uh, Connecticut. Um, the gray coral causes problems, um, as does the ringed honey, uh, ringed uh, um, oyster mushroom, Pleurotus dryanus. And the last one in there is the bluet, the Lapista nuda, which is a gorgeous mushroom. I think I have a picture of it coming up here. Maybe I'll go straight to that and come back. Um, yeah, whoop. Here's the Lapista nuda on the left-hand side there. Oh, come on. Gorgeous mushroom, great late season kind of edible mushroom extender. If it's uncooked, it will sicken you, however. Um. <clears throat> so someone says, the lion's mane makes my throat weird, like an allergic reaction. Um, and somebody else had told me that as well. You'll see that in a second. Um, so toxic reactions. My first trial with the Boletus bicolor, the, the two-color Bolete, I got sick pretty violently. And any comments in there in parentheses are my notes. And I said, it's likely another Bolete. I got sick after eating a lobster mushroom. Did it parasitize an Amanita? If it was orange, no. There are some hypomyces that do parasitize Amanitas, but not that one. But some people do get sick of that mushroom. And this one, my wife and I ate that lilac brown bolete in Nova Scotia. She got sick, but I was fine. And I've had some cases where one person in a couple or two people out of four got sick. But my experience is most people, if you eat it very many times, are going to get sick with that mushroom. My own personal experience, that nasty, intense, gastrointestinal nausea and vomiting uh, lasted about almost 12 hours. Not a fun day. Um, 1986, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Um, mushrooms given to us by another person that we thought were chanterelles, but were not. So I think they were jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, and we both got sick, very, you know, very sick. Boletus heronensis, I'm going to talk about in a second. That's a mushroom that I'm seeing more poisonings with. Um, it's a northern mushroom, more common the further north you go in Maine, um, but it was first identified and described from Maine um, right around Camden. Um, uh, and it's a beautiful mushroom, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, but it's, it's nasty. Um, and I love this one. I did have a lot of dreams after eating chanterelles three nights in a row. Ah. I wonder, I, want, I want to know the content of those dreams. So the problematic um, boletes, and this on the left-hand side is boletus sensibilis, called the sensitive bolete because it so rapidly turns blue when it's handled. Um, and it's gorgeous. It's one of a group of boletes that have a reddish cap. This is more pinkish red. Um, the yellow pore surface and a combination of yellow and red on the stalk. And they bruise some level of blue. And some of them are edible and some of them are toxic, and it's not a beginner's mushroom to understand. On the bottom right is a range of ages in that lilac brown bolete. It is really common mid to late summer across a lot of Maine. Um, it looks handsome, it's gorgeous, and some of the old um, field guides call it edible. 
including the um, um, Audubon Guide. But though it apparently is eaten down in the southeast, uh, I find almost nobody who's eaten it successfully here more than once. Um, and the top right one there is the Boletus heronensis. It doesn't even have a common name. It's a handsome mushroom. I find them sometimes just the buttons bigger than my fist. It's firm. It's almost never buggy, which in the middle of summer is a bad sign. Um, and it will, it causes some very intense um, sickenings. So learn it and avoid it. And these are the ones I talked about already that are toxic if they're raw or undercooked. Um, some great edible mushrooms here, the, all the chicken mushrooms, the honey mushrooms, the bluets, um, well loved by many people, but not, not if you like a raw food diet or are undercooked mushrooms. Now I wanna move on to just another reality. Oops, I wanna first mention this one. I forgot this was here. This is the, uh, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. And if you've ever found them, sometimes they can be huge clusters of 30, 40, 70, 90 mushrooms within one cluster from a base, usually at the base of a big old oak tree or sometimes where an oak tree has been removed. They're handsome, they're beautiful, um, they literally glow in the dark. They um, have bioluminescence. But if you eat them, you will get quite sick for a number of hours. Um, so stay away from it. Now, I love, I quote my friend Michaeline uh, here, who says, you know, if you're eating wild mushrooms, really think about eating no more than the serving size that can kind of fit comfortably in the palm of your hand. Because mushrooms are difficult for us to digest. And it's not at all uncommon if you eat a huge meal or you eat them over and over, you will get sick. So these are some statements that kind of go with that. Um, I did not get ill, but I ate too many mushrooms in one sitting and it made me uncomfortable. A lot of that material isn't digestible if you get my meaning. Someone with a sensible, sensitive digestion tract, they always use caution. I only eat sulfur shelf in small amounts or I get loose stools. And this next one, I'm gonna try and paraphrase it. Lady of Porus, the sulfur shelf I can eat, but a few years ago I had like six breakfasts in a row. And on the seventh breakfast, I got queasy. The next morning, another, so eighth day in a row, and I was so sick I had to go to bed. But I thought maybe I had a hangover or food poisoning. So held off the next day, but on the ninth day I ate the remaining, a bigger portion than I previously had, and I became so sick I was in bed for the rest of the day. This is not very rapid learning. Um, and I also wonder if you have mushrooms in your refrigerator for now at least nine days, they could have also gotten spoiled. So, but still, that way too much mushrooms. Um, and that woman who has been collecting mushrooms for 77 years, this is from her. She said, once I eat too many hun honey mushrooms which grew on white pine and looked especially robust and good, Result was chuck up. Um, and if you knew her, you, would, you could just see that coming out of her mouth. So not too much of a good thing. And there, for some people, they'll develop reactions over time, um, eating too many mushrooms or repeatedly, or um, sometimes it's almost an allergic reaction that can happen. Sometimes that happens with people with, with the hen of the woods. Um, and you can find those, you can find one mushroom that might be 10 or even 20 pounds, um, a lot of food, and uh, there's that temptation toward gluttony. Avoid that. So this person, Morels, eaten over a period of a week or so, um, began to get a reaction. Even the Coprinus, like the shaggy mane, same thing, too many meals. Here, another person, lion's mane, makes my throat tingly. Um, diarrhea from eating far too many black trumpets over a three-day period. And I spoke to this woman at the time, severe diarrhea. She says, thankfully, it has never happened again because she loves black trumpets. Um, so Griffola frondosa, the same way, the head of the woods, just be aware. Um, treat them respectfully. So I also, this time, I included a question. 
do you collect and use wild mushrooms for their health benefits? And a little bit to my, my surprise, more than 50% said, yeah, I do. And let's talk. They have that same kind of word doodle um, of the, the species that they used. You know, chaga, the turkey tail, lion's mane, the head of the woods, uh, reishi, um, birch polypore, red belted polypore. So a lot of them, and many people use them. Um, and just some of the comments were really important, I thought. Let me go the other direction. Uh, here's some of the common edible ones. And on, in this slide, the oyster mushroom is edible and medicinal. The other two are medicinal, but not so edible. Like the uh, reishi or uh, hemlock varnish called the Ganoderma is a wonderful medicinal mushroom. Quite, quite bitter and quite tough. So you'd never consider it using it as food. In the same way with the chaga, um, excellent as a tea or as a tincture, but very tough and moody. You can never consider using it for food. Um, uh oh, what happened there? Um, I lost a slide. Um, so I, one of the things that I noticed that was in that slide of comments, I'm not sure what happened there, is many people said, particularly people who've been eating mushrooms for 20, 30, 40 years, said, you know, I don't collect and use them particularly for medicinal, but I consider mushrooms as such a healthy food, my health benefits from a regular use of mushrooms in my diet. Um, so that was one of the more common things was said in that. Um, one of the last questions I asked, I said, so have you or do you um, consider collecting mushrooms for resale, becoming a commercial mushroom forager. And so I asked them to, to check several things. There was about 15% who said, yeah, I do it right now. The majority, more than 60% said, I collect and use mushrooms only for my immediate family. And I think that includes friends. But about 20% said, I've considered it or I want to learn how. And the comments on this question were really powerful. Um, and it, I could divide them up from the right hand to the left side from kind of really interested and want to do it to those that are, that are really annoyed by it. And in the center, I kind of sum up the people who, who, who have trouble with it. Selling is stupid. The fun is in the hunt. And those people who collect and sell them commercially might say that it's fun to do that. But I would agree that if you're collecting with the intention of selling at the end, it changes your relationship with them. But a fair number of people would be interested, and some people concerned about over-harvesting, about that extraction mentality, um, and um, you know, one person summed it up, why, why ruin a great hobby by turning it into a job? And for some people, much stronger reactions. I highly disapprove of commercial collection. It's antithetical to the spirit of foraging. Chefs that serve wild mushrooms at restaurants should learn to collect themselves. You know, I believe that the chefs who are gonna serve the mushrooms should know them as well as the foragers, strongly. Um, but it's, a, it's a interesting, the range of comments. Uh-oh, what did I miss there? Something's going on with my, okay, here we go. So this is a really important slide because what we ask next is, you know, now, what are you interested in learning? What would help you the most in the near future? And remember, we're asking people who, most of whom have been doing mushrooming, um, and the most highly sought after learning was an advanced class on bow lead identification. And it's something we've talked about doing through the main mycological for a few years. I've talked about doing it on my own. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm committed to doing it this, this year. It's not something anyone can say, well, we're gonna do it on August 12th. Um, because you really have to respond to a, a heavy dose of rain because that's when all the bullets are gonna be coming. Um, the second most highly sought after was an advanced identification on the guild mushrooms. And I, we'll see if someone can offer that in the next year. But uh, more mushroom walks, more day-long identification classes were desired. Um, I'll be offering a bunch of those. Some people wanted a good field guide for this area. About 40% of people wanted a mushroom a medicinal mushroom uh, workshop, and I, I do those each year. Um, smaller 
group wanted a mushroom cultivation class and sometimes if they're offered, I know that North Spore occasionally offers them and I'm hoping that maybe we can get one offered through Maine Mycological. And uh, a mushroom identification and cooking class was something else that was, that was interested in. The week-long mushroom identification seminar, uh, Michaeline Mulvey and, and I teach that every year up at uh, Eagle Hill. And there's, sometimes there are other mycologists that teach there as well. And if you don't know what Eagle Hill is, it's a wonderful, wonderful resource for the state of Maine that's up in Washington County in Steuben. And they teach a range of uh, Na uh, natural history workshops. So let's get to, um, I just threw this in as those confusing boletes. Uh, another picture on the right, upper right of the Boletus heronensis. Uh, the bolete that's on the left there, I have collected that in the same place three different years and I'm still not sure what species it is. Um, the variation on the lower right hand corner is a gray Bolita, Retoboletus uh, grisius, and, but it's a little different, so I'm not positive about that one. And then on the left-hand side are four different species of boletes. Fun. I love boletes. They are a challenge. Um, every year I use um, the bolete book that was uh, published by Bissett, Bissett, and Rudy in 2016, Boletes of Eastern North America. It has got a ton of mushrooms in it, great keys, and still somewhat limited in, in, uh, in ca catching them all. So other learning topics, um, and some of these, it's fun. You know, trips to places where there are better Boletus sedulus and, and somewhere where I can find morels as well, um, where I can find Matsutake. So show me where your fishing holes are, in other words, some of that, um, but some really good, um, some suggestions. Um, Someone in the bottom there said, after talking with individuals from Switzerland, I discovered they have local inspection offices there. So the public has access to consult with experts about the mushrooms they collect. Maybe we can do that here with a volunteer. That's quite a commitment, but I agree. Um, I, there are people who do that mentoring, and that's why you need to find a mentor in your area. So other learning, um, would you know, they'd love a, a week-long class. Uh, mushroom dyes and paper making, which would be wonderful. Something on the crusts and the small ascos, uh, very challenging. Um, uh, strategies for re remembering what we've forgotten. You know, every year I kind of have to wake up my brain and wrap my tongue around some of those names. So how do we, and someone said flashcards, mnemonics, fungal ID calisthenics, I love that, that comment. So think about what learning topics are important for you. Of the ones that were suggested, oh man, I'm having trouble with some of my slides. There we go, all right, no. Um, of those suggested topics, um, here we go. Um, the ones we're gonna be offering in, in this year that will be available in the state of Maine are the ones with stars on it. So I've committed, and maybe we'll do a second one through the Maine Mycological to an advanced bullet identification. Likely that will be sometime from mid-September to mid-August to mid-September. Um, a half-day mushroom foraging and cooking class, which means a half-day foraging and then the evening cooking. Uh, I've got one scheduled at the um, Penobscot Language School in Rockland for September 13th, I may do a second one. Um, always, the Maine Mycological Association hosts uh, about a dozen forays, primarily on weekends, scattered across the state. Join the MMA and, um, and join our forays. It's a great way to learn. Um, we'll do be doing the Eagle Hill five-day mushroom camp uh, the last, the week that encompasses the last uh, days of July and the first of August. Um, and I'll be doing, so far I think I've scheduled nine uh, day-long workshops on identification of uh, edible and medicinal mushrooms scattered across the state. Um, and I'm looking for someone to offer a cultivation. I just don't have the, the bandwidth right now. I used to do those. So plenty of opportunities to learn. Um, and think about what you want and reach out. Um, reach out to Maine Mycological. Um, reach out to someone in your area. Um, that can help you. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the limitations of this study. 
the information I gathered, absolutely not representative of the population, but likely it's representing the people who are interested in mushrooms and out there collecting. Um, without a doubt, what I've been seeing, what we've been seeing all over, is there's an increase in interest in mushrooms. And the huge success of the film that was released this year, um, Fantastic Fungi, is just one example of that. Um, but we're also seeing that reflected in inc an increase in mushroom poisonings. Um, I have been working as a volunteer um, consultant with the poison centers for oh, more than 15 years. And certainly over the past five years, I've seen a, a much higher incidence of exposures that have symptoms, including a couple that were near lethal um, in, in Northern New England. So we need to be cautious as we move forward. So I put the picture of the fly Amanita, the Amanita muscaria here, because that's one some people collect and use recreationally. Um, it's a really complex set of toxins. Um, and it's not one I would ever recommend for that type of use. Um, someone asked me the name of the book. I'll talk to you about that in a second. So again, acknowledging the Maine Mycological Association and everything that is done through that volunteer organization in terms of teaching, um, and another great picture of chanterelles and black trumpets. Um, I don't at the moment don't have a website. I may reawaken that. I was too involved in my other work to keep it up. Um, but feel free to email me to get on the distribution list for, for class uh, schedule of classes I'll be offering. Um, and in terms of books and resources, the book that I held up, it's called Whole Leafs of uh, Eastern North America. And it's by Alan Bissett, uh, Bill, William Rudy, and Arlene Bissett. Looks a lot like that. Um, excellent book. Um, a couple other books that I would recommend in terms of identification. Uh, Timothy Baroni put out a pretty comprehensive identification guide. Um, he's in, in New York State, mycologist, um, mushrooms of northeastern United States and eastern Canada. Um, I like it. He goes deeper into some of the little brown mushrooms and many other authors, um, does a good job with that. Um, feel free to find a copy of Chanterelle Dreams and Manita Nightmares. It's still in print and around, um, and it deals, yeah, someone's holding it up there. Um, it's fun. It's not an identification guide, but it does contain a lot of information about some of the foolproof mushrooms. Um, and in terms of websites, I mentioned the French one, Myco Quebec, M Y C O Q U E B E C. You'll get in there. And mushroomexpert.com, Michael Quos. Um, there's some others out there. There are some really, there's a, a nice uh, main mushroom hunting uh, Facebook group that many people find quite useful. Um, there's some others. Some of the Facebook groups I worry about, um, just be cautious and make sure that there's good uh, facilitators. Um, and somebody asked me about, talk about honey mushrooms again. You know, for years we've known that there's a small percentage of people that don't deal well with honey mushrooms. It'll trigger a, a gastric upset. Um, certainly, I think some of that is because they may be undercooked. It does require really good cooking, um, but they're widely eaten across the world. Um, and, but just be cautious, you know, if you're eating them for the first few times, eat small amounts, make sure you cook them quite well. Um, and do you want to unmute people if they want to raise hands for questions? I'm just trying to look through in terms of other questions that people have asked. Um, just because we're at the question phase, the other end of the, the Bufo Americana. Um, Someone said, Russ, again, do you consider gypsy mushroom to still be safe edible? Um, it's lumped in quaternaries, but as, an, as a species, yeah, it's quite edible and people, people like it and use it. It's a, uh, quaternaries is a complex genus, but you know, that Rosides um, caparata or quaternaries caparata has been used for, for a long time. Again, it's not a beginner's mushroom, but I, I, I enjoy it. Um, Someone's, okay, we've got honey mushrooms. Someone, several people uh, had enthusiastic recommendations for the Eagle Hill Seminar. Um, those are our past students, I believe. 
I, I love doing it. It's for me, it's a working vacation. I work my tail off, but we have so much fun. Um, so some people talk about eating the baby re reishi. Uh, Ganoderma tsuge, if it's just coming up, if it's a button from the wood and it's not coloring yet, it's not yet bitter, um, yeah, you can eat it or you can leave it there and collect it later and use it medicinally. Um, I have a hard, I'm pretty confident identifying mushrooms. I want to be to consume, but I have a hard time locating where they are. Um, Ms. Sullivan, I would say get out in the woods and wander around because there are just buku mushrooms out there. But it requires that we get out there and compete with the ticks. And that's one of the, the things that I need to warn you. If you're going to be out in the woods collecting mushrooms this time of year and through the spring to, mid, to almost to midsummer, lots of ticks and then again in the fall. So wear tick protective clothing um, and, and scan yourself. Um, I've had Lyme disease several times and thankfully um, that I uh, caught them early. And that's thankful because of the woman I live with is an excellent diagnostician. So someone says, are there any apps that you like? The only app I currently have on my phone that I use is the app from Michael Quebec, which I love. Um, it's still in French. Um, somebody else, if you, if you have thoughts on apps, you can write into the, um, into, into the chat box. Um, other questions out there? Did you see any? I want to open it up for questions, Julia. Um, if people want to raise their hand, we can unmute them individually. All right. So Jude said, you know, are chanterelles only yellow? I found a large patch the past few years under white pine, but they were very light pink. Um, you know, I have found, in fact, last year under white pine, I found a group of, you know, they were pretty much pure white. And I found them, those are in Kennebec County. I found them in Washington County. I found them other places occasionally. And for a while, people were trying to say, well, you know, maybe it's a different species, but I think it's just a little variation. Um, I've eaten them um, just testing them out in small quantities. Um, they're, they're more uh, a curiosity than anything else. And in southern parts of New England, there is a, a paler um, chanterelle that's pretty common. how long do you have to cook to be safe? Are we talking about honey mushrooms? You know, a question comes up a lot. How do you define thoroughly cooked? And this is the way I've always done it. It's not based on temperature or duration, but you know, most mushroom, mushrooms are like 80 or more percent water. And you put them in a pan, either dry or with a, an oil or butter, and you put the heat to them and they start giving up their water. And for me, um, if they're dry, you know, if they seem to be a little desiccated, I'll add a little white wine, but I let that water come out and I let it boil off completely. And then in my opinion, they're thoroughly cooked and I go on to do whatever I do with them. So which mushrooms would I suggest starting for the absolute beginner? We've covered most of them right now. Chanterelles, the golden chanterelle, black trumpet, if you can find them, and they're, they're much more challenging to find. Um, Sulfur shelf, you know, use with caution and cook it well. Um, but if you find Hen of the Woods, absolutely. Um, we have no toxic lookalikes here. In Southern New England, you get the blackening uh, polypore, but even that it looks quite different. Um, those are the ones I really, the, uh, the two toothed mushrooms, the lion's mane and the hedgehog or sweet tooth are both unmistakable and excellent edibles. Um, so those are five or six to really start with and grow from there. Um, I've been you know, collecting for many, many, many years. Um, and I am, you know, my wife pointed out to me how cautious I am. After I got sickened in 1986, which was the only time, um, I, you know, by then I was eating a lot of mushrooms. Now, if I'm eating a new mushroom, I, I know that I've collected it at least four or five times. And, you know, I'll collect it and I'll think I'll eat it and then it ends up in the compost. And then, you know, by the time I know what it is, walking 30 or 40 feet away, that's when I feel like I'm comfortable eating it. And then the first time I eat it, it's only me. I only eat it and I only eat a small amount. Um, I would never bring it to a potluck. 
but over over time, um, as I get to used to it, then maybe so. So someone, Jennifer says, does drying affect toxicity, as in making sure it is well cooked? No. Um, depending on the mushroom, um, for things like uh, honey mushrooms, which I dry a lot of, I would still always cook them after I rehydrate them. Um, and if you, you know, not too many people dry the uh, sulfur shell for chicken of the woods, the textural thing, but even then I would want to cook it. So drying does not take its place. Giant puffball, okay. Yeah, the first mushroom I ever ate was uh, a, a puffball, and that was back in 1978 in New Mexico. Um, and giant puffball is, you know, those pure white, if you cut the mushroom open and inside, it's just pure white, undifferentiated, no sign of any structure, um, puffball. Those are um, pretty broadly uh, good, good to go in terms of an edible. And some of them are really tasty. So someone said they had found a blackened polypore growing on an old stump in Falmouth. I have found the blackening polypore in Scarborough as well, um, but not very common in Maine. Um, and I think the first time when I found it, it may have been the first time it had been identified in Maine, much more common further south. Um, let's see. Two of my favorite boletes to collect and eat are the chrome-footed bolete and the bluing uh, Bowie gyroporus cyanescens. Um, yes, I would agree. They're both easily identifiable, good edibles. Um, we cooked and ate a, a number of really young, firm uh, yellowfoot bolides or chrome footed bolides this summer, and people loved them. Um, black trumpets, if you dry them, do they still need to be cooked? Um, if you had a little bit of their flavor, you probably get away with not cooking them. In large quantities, I would definitely cook them. Any thoughts on inky mushroom? My neighbor has many of them. I may steal them. You know, and the tutors, I'm going to ask you which species, because there's a lot of species of inky caps. Um, some of them, like cap the Caprinus atramentarius, the uh, Tipler's bane, um, is, or alcohol inky. If you eat it, it's a great mushroom if you cook it. If you eat it, with alcohol or have alcohol sometimes up to 72 hours after you eat it, you'll get sick. And that always brings up the question, is it the mushroom that's toxic or is it the alcohol? I'll let you decide that. But other, other inky caps, um, I, there's several species I eat and really enjoy. If they're shaggy manes, wonderful. If they're the tiny little mica caps, you get them young, wonderful edible. Um, Fired up my imagination. Okay, don't even give me the reading. Can you please talk about locations where we might find morels? <laughs> oh, Gene. Um, yes, you'll find them where they grow. Where I have luck, um, there are a couple of old apple orchards where I find them. And it's usually not that are down in the bottom land where it's really moist, but more kind of knobs where there's grasses. Um, I find them sometimes um, right near recently dead elm trees. And in more uh, sweet soil forests, I find them with white ash. But it's an opportunity to really get out in the woods in the spring and look. Um, it took me probably 20, 25 years before I consistently would find them every year. They are worth finding. Yeah. What mushroom is grown on dead apple trees? No idea. There's, so, there's a lot of woody polypores of wood. Um, Eileen and Jason said, are there wild psychedelic mushrooms which grow in Maine? Yes. <laughs> um, come to a class where you literally learn identification skills. I'm happy to talk to you more about that. I'm not gonna dive into deeply of them here in this kind of setting. Akala has said, I'm finding horse mushrooms that look like they have been hypo hypomycized. Um, yeah, there is a hypo a hypomyces that does get the horse mushrooms late in the years. It's a, like it's a mold that grows on the gills on the underside of the species of agaricus. Um, and I, I don't trust them in terms of edibility once it's, once, it, once it's attacked. I've not seen any studies on whether it makes them toxic or not, but it, it turns me off. Um, other questions? 
to check my time here. Okay, we're only about an hour into it. Good. I've talked fast. Any kind of other questions? And if people want to, if you want to open and unmute people to do it. Um, Ma'am, did you have a question? I unmuted Vicki. Vicki Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Greg, I just wanted to say, I, I said it on the chat, but in case you don't read it, you're such a treasure and your, your enthusiasm is just so palpable and makes us all excited to get out there and look for these for these mushrooms but thank you so much for your time and your expertise um you know and what i value um there was a period of time when i was early on in this i started using a lot of jargony words and, and a lot of latin which is important but i i really want to make sure that i can translate this world of mushrooms into the bite-sized pieces that people can start to uh, catch on to and use because they're a wonderful resource if used thoughtfully. Um, someone asked, do I have tips for enjoying and storing mushrooms year round? Oh yeah. And it's gonna be a different suggestion depending on the mushroom. There are some mushrooms that just shine dried. Almost any of the boletes that riches their flavor, they're wonderful. Um, I made a bolete or a, a porcini gravy with a leg of lamb um, at Easter. Um, um, morels um, also dry wonderfully and rehydrate wonderfully. The other thing we added Easter was a, a morel a risotto. Um, other things don't do well dried at all. Um, you can dry a hen of the woods, it dries fine, um, and the flavor is good, and the medicinal components are still there, but the texture is like shoe leather. So when I, if I dry those, I put them in a steel uh, bladed blender and powder them. There's a lot of mushrooms that are really good dry, uh, sauteed and then frozen. I do that with chanterelles, black trumpets, uh, boletes, any of the uh, meadow mushrooms, horse mushroom. Um, but it really depends a little bit on, on the species of mushroom. Do shaggy manes have any lookalikes you should be aware of? Um, there are a couple obscure caprinas that look kind of like them, but in general, no. They're so distinctive. And they typically come in big clusters or groupings. Um, it's, as I said, it's the third mushroom I ever ate. Um, and I still love it a lot. All right, so any other final questions? Oh, what is the best way to dry? Um, in New Mexico, where I grew there, I would dry them on a screen because the relative humidity was about 9%. Uh, here, I almost, I almost always use some type of dehydrator. Now, there are some crude methods. In many parts of rural Maine, it's typical to see a car that's no longer functioning in someone's dooryard. And a car that's in the sun with screens is a phenomenal dehydrator. Um, if you have an unheated barn or attic space um, that gets quite hot, that's uninsulated in the summer, that's also an excellent way to dry things with a screen. Um, oh, you know, someone says, can I talk about identifying Matsutake? Um, it's kind of hard to do it in this setting without more photographs. Um, you always want to make sure, they're in, in Maine, they're almost only grow with hemlock. Um, and then, you know, start learning. There's a couple of lookalikes, like the Catasilema uh, Imperial Cat, um, but it's the smell. Learn the smell, because nothing else smells like a Matsutake. Some people call it spicy. I think there's a little bit more of old sweat socks mixed in there. Um, if I'm dehydrating, someone asked about the temperature. I generally, depending on the mushroom and how long, um, somewhere between 105 and 115 degrees. Julia, you've been great as a, as a host here and, uh, and, and for, for hosting this. Um, I need to say I'm doing, and this is, Julia can cover her ears, the Rockland Public Library, which is where I live, um, is hosting another different type of mushrooming Zoom on the 30th of April. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, it won't be covering the same material, but more it's kind of that introduction to the season and talking about what the season ahead. Well, Greg, we definitely hope to have you back again on this and other topics. Um, I really enjoyed this a lot tonight. Um, I want to thank everyone who came, and I want to just remind you that 
We have recorded this and I will be uploading this onto the Camden Public Library Programs YouTube page and then I'm going to share that link on Facebook. I think the Maine Mycological Association also planned to circulate the link. Um, yep. Greg, I'm sure can circulate the link too once we have it all up and going. So recommend this to your friends if you enjoyed it. Um, and if you had friends who weren't able to get into the program, um, I apologize to them. We only had room for 100 participants, and that's why we recorded it. Um, if you enjoy these type of free programs, we definitely um, would love to have your support at the Camden Public Library. You can reach out to donate by uh, going to librarycamden.org slash donate. And we are going to be having a very special fundraiser going on starting next week, which is National Library Week. Yay! Um, and during that fundraiser, we are hoping to get the public to help us raise $50,000 by June 30th um, to help us cover our basic operating expenses. So um, again, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in this evening. And thank you so much, Greg. I look forward to speaking with you about some future presentations <laughs> real soon. All right. And <laughs> I want to, you know, if you're interested in learning mushrooms, join the Maine Mycological Association. Yes. It's all of about 12 bucks a year. Um, and if you like hanging around out with people who are, uh, you know, socially deficient and love mushrooms, God, you have found your tribe. Um, I certainly did many years ago when I started hanging out with them. Um, great group of people, some of my good friends. All right. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful evening and be well.